Thank you, Carly, and I'm not musician enough to know when it's over, so I usually get an early start. I'm just ready to go, you know. This, is, uh, this has been one of those kinds of weeks that we've all uh, been touched by what's been on the news media, and uh, our hearts grieve at the sadnesses and the hurt and the pain that is taking place throughout our world. Uh, but I will tell you, um, for a number of years, uh, this has nothing to do with me being pastor, and yet it has everything to do with me being pastor. For a number of years, I felt very strongly uh, that we were in the days when Jesus would come again. I think Paul felt that way. I've shared this maybe with some of you before. Uh, I'm hesitant because I'm not an expert on eschatology. Uh, I've studied it enough to know that if there were one or two more verses, we, would be, we could be more sure on how things are going to transpire. And I've always said that the Lord didn't put me on the Ways and Means Committee. He put me on the Preparation Committee. And so uh, that's, that's my perspective. And yet at the same time, and I don't know how to understand this, but I have felt since I was a little boy that Jesus would come in my lifetime. And I could be wrong about that. Because he said, no one knows the day nor the hour, only the Father in heaven. But you're going to hear me say some things in this verse that's not an in-your-face challenge or anything like that, but just some things uh, in the course of this message that I think we need to take heed. We need to be ready, and we need to prepare our own hearts first, and then make sure that we're on the right course as a congregation. And I think those marching orders come in those verses we read. Um, but the title of the message, and if you'll open your Bibles to Matthew 23 and keep them open, uh, we'll navigate our way through that. I want to give a lot of introduction, and then we'll get to the points and pull out some things that we can build our life on and we can build our church on. The title is, When Religion Goes Rogue. Now, religion by itself is not a bad word. It simply means worship of a God that is superior to all. But it doesn't necessarily mean a relationship with God. It can refer to form. It can refer to ritual. It can refer to uh, all of those kinds of things. And typically, when we think of religion, we think of that which is lifeless. Uh, you know, are, are we life-giving or life-draining? And so much of what we see in the name of religion is life draining. And that's when it's turned what I call rogue. We hear of rogue elephants that just break off from the herd and stomp through the jungles and stomp through villages and things of that nature. And everything in their path is destruction. And that's what happens when religion turns rogue. That which is designed to be a true worship of God, that which is designed to honor Him and give Him the rightful place in our lives, in our society, that He should have, can and does turn into that which burdens and destroys people. Governments can do the same. Very often the secular politic becomes the politic of the church. It becomes the method of the church, and it's what in the Old Testament God judged the people for, and it's called syncretism, where you wed everything like that together. They wed the worship of pagan idols, they wed their government structure, they wed everything all together, and said that they were a society that worshipped God. And God judged them. Because when you create an atmosphere of idolatry, it is the worst sin that we could do. And that's what they did in the Old Testament. That was the case in Israel. Now the Pharisees arose after the return from Babylonian captivity. Theirs was an institutional and a collective effort to prevent the people from ever going back into idolatry. And so what they did, they took the original Hidden Commandments and over the years they created laws that ultimately were called fence laws to keep people from violating the Ten Commandments. In fact, they didn't even want them to get close. They, they were moving them far away from that. But as the human condition warrants, because we're a fallen race and a fallen people, things seldom get better without a move of God. They always get worse. They might look good. I, I've been 
in my spare time. You know how when you get on Facebook or you get on the internet, you get on your iPhone, and if you ever check into a site, whatever they're selling, everybody that sells that is going to send you an ad. You're going to get it. I had a 1966 GTO. That's how I got her. Here, she'll take my car today. You know, that little Volkswagen bug, here, here take my GTO. So uh, we had a lot of fun. And, you know, you sell used cars. And we got married, and the GTO went, and a Chevy Nova came into our room, and the Chevy Nova is the worst car I've ever had in my life. And I got on a site for 66 GTOs, and that's all the ads I've got all week. It's 66 and 67 GTOs. And I've looked back, and oh, man. So if I got a vintage car, they're $60,000, $70,000. And I could live there, and I could be there, and I could try to live in that world, but it's gone. And that was the mistake of the Pharisees. They kept trying to live in a world that never was. It was a world of their creation. It was not a world of God's creation. And yet they claimed God's name and they wanted to do the things that God wanted them to do. And as a general rule, they were self-righteous. They were smug in their delusion that they were pleasing God because they kept the law or parts of it at least. As Jesus pointed out to them, however, as scrupulous as they were, as hard as they tried to follow the finer points of ritualism, they failed to measure up to God's standard. They failed to know God. Jesus often engaged them, and they engaged him in debate. He brought correction to the application of the law. He would say very often, you've heard it was said of them of old, but I say to you, and yet there was neither remorse nor repentance on the part of the Pharisees, but the plotting of the death of Jesus. And so we have this text. Jesus is in the temple. He's teaching. I'm assuming that a lot of the scribes and Pharisees were there listening. And he goes into this dialogue and gives dire and scathing warning. He moves out of the temple in chapter 24 to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples get it. They're smart enough to figure it out, that something is about to change. And so as they move with him to the Mount of Olives, they ask him those questions in the early part of Matthew 24. But in 23, he gives a stating judgment on Israel that's consistent with the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28 in the Old Testament. Moses gave those to the nation and said, if you will do these things, God will bless you, but if you depart and do these, God will curse you. Now that's true today. The standard of God has never changed. The understanding of God's character revealed through the law has not changed, but we have gone from the old covenant that said you do this and live to the new covenant between Jesus and the Father in which we come to Jesus and our sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit comes into us and leads us in the paths of righteousness. Judgment came in 70 A.D. to the nation of Israel. But there's application for us today. So what is that application? Remember, Jesus came to reveal God. He said to the disciples when Philip said, Lord, just show us the Father, and, and that'll be sufficient. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Read the Gospels. Take care. So what is he saying to us in these first five verses? Religion can become rogue. So how do we keep it from becoming rogue? Number one, live your faith. Live your faith. Religion becomes rogue when our application of Scripture is inconsistent with our interpretation of Scripture. Does that make sense? You follow me? 
We get over here and we say, bless God, this is what the Bible teaches. And it does this and it does this and it does this. And in our Sunday schools and everything else, we're really good at that. And then over here on the Monday through Saturday side, we live a different ethic and a different life. That's when our religion goes rogue. Jesus taught us to recognize truth and to obey truth. These Pharisees occupied Moses' seat. What's meant by that? Especially the scribes, they were the interpreters of the law. But as is often true with legalists, they don't know God. In John chapter 5, verses 36 through 37, let me read this to you. It's a sobering passage. Verse 36 in John's Gospel. Jesus looks at them and says, I have a testimony weightier. In other words, better than that of John. For the works the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if anyone else comes in, my own, in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Those were the words of Jesus to the scribes and the Pharisees. We can be guilty of the same thing. We can be inconsistent. And even though they didn't know God, they were the most conservative. They were respected by the people. They would fight you over the scriptures. But their application was in error. It's critical that we live our faith. That we live our faith. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from among your fellow servants. You must listen to him. And that's Jesus. And if we're going to live our faith, we must live as we believe. Not only recognize and obey truth, but live what we believe. And we actually do. Because our lifestyle shows what we really believe. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how we do it. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 11 says, Even small children are known by their actions. So is their conduct really pure and upright? Now, I I, I don't want to out anybody because there are some children of parents in this room today. Uh, But you know what I mean. Some of us raised some little stinkers, didn't we? And their conduct wasn't pure and upright. They were known by what they did. I had such fun with one of ours. My son, he talked in his sleep. I'd hear him talking in his sleep and sound asleep, and I'd go sit on the edge of his bed and interview him. (laughs) He said one day, I can't do anything and get away with it. I don't know how Dad knows everything I do. See, the struggle of the Christian life is to take what we know in our head of Scripture and apply it to how we live, what we say and what we do, so that there's a consistency. And the world is longing to see that in us. They are longing to see a people who live what they believe. And all you've got to do is go talk to your friends and neighbors and ask them who's the greatest Christian you know. And they'll tell you, and then ask them why. 
And it won't have anything to do with the depth of Bible knowledge they have. It'll have everything to do with the way they live it out. That's true of all of us. We must live as we believe. James said in verse 17 of chapter 4, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. And so Jesus starts in these first few verses and he says you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but don't do what they do. And then he comes in verse 5 and says everything they do is done for people to see. So the second point is this. You not only live your faith, but live your faith to glorify God. Everything for His honor. Everything for His glory. Everything for His purpose. Religion goes wrong when our motive becomes selfish. And it becomes about us. Everything they do is done for people to see. That was the assessment of Jesus on their motive. He illustrates it in verses 13 through 32. There there are seven woes in that passage. If you have um, some translations, they break one of the woes down into two, and so there's eight. And uh, what they were doing, they were simply twisting Scripture to fit themselves. And Jesus illustrates it, and I'm not going to go into all of those. But it shows the ways, whether it's titles, whether it's manipulation of the truth of God, or regardless of what it is, they were building their own little kingdom. And they held people in bondage by requiring them keep certain laws. And if they did certain things that they didn't like, they would put them out of the temple. They would put them out of the synagogue. And they would, it's, it's sort of like the Catholic priest that said to Nancy Pelosi that you can't take communion anymore for what you believe. Now, I don't agree with Nancy Pelosi. I want that said loud and clear. I do not agree with that political position. But the error of the religious system in which she finds herself is that a human being thinks he can keep her from the graces of God. And when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, no one can keep you from the grace of God. You are the only one that can stop God's flow of grace into your life. And the remembrance of the Lord's Supper, there's nothing in that that will save us, we remember that we were saved by what Christ did at the cross. But it's a modern day example of a human being without going through church discipline saying, this is what you can and cannot do. You get the difference? And that's not to defend her. That's not to defend her position, which is indefensible. Because it's a moral position. But here, through all of these titles and manipulations, these Pharisees, these teachers of law, kept the kingdom from the people for whom Christ came to die. Now, let me say this. I don't think any of us are doing that. I don't think this church is doing that. If I did, I would have preached it from that direction. But I think that we have to ever be vigilant and we have to ever be focused on what is important and not the tertiary and not the side issues and things of that nature. We can't get sidetracked from what God has called us to do. Now I want to do something. I did it myself. You and I all know our our lives are in the hands of God, right? Right? Our days are numbered. He knows when we're going to see Him. He knows when we're going to meet Him. But we don't. But here's an application of that. I want you to think how old you are. Just in your mind say, I'm years old. I want you to seriously consider 
how many years on this planet you think you have? And I think if you're reasonable, you'll conclude with me that we don't have enough years left to get embroiled and sidetrack us from our mission. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, and said, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Our commanding officer is one. I want the rest of my days, regardless of where I am, regardless of what I'm doing, I want the rest of my days to be lived trying to please my commanding officer. Let's keep our motives pure. That's what this was about. It was about their motives. Why they did what they did. And it was all for show. All to be seen. All to control a religious system. So live your faith. Live your faith to glorify God. And then live your faith to serve God. And to serve others. Verse 11. The greatest among you will be your servant for those who exalt themselves shall be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Religion goes rogue when we lose our servant motif. Cheryl and I were at a convention a number of years ago. Young pastor sitting, I believe it was the Astrodome in Houston, Billy Graham was going to speak. We were so far away we could barely see him. But the man that introduced him, I'll never forget the words, never, ever forget the words. He introduced Billy Graham as a man who had never forgotten that he was a servant. You know, we can forget that. Jesus said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. Now, what does that word serve mean? That, that doesn't mean that we're everybody's gopher and we do what everybody says we ought to do. No, that's not at all what it means. We have giftings. We have responsibilities. But servanthood is about motive and attitude and why we do what we do. And we do it for the glory of God and we do it for people to help people, to help them strengthen and grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Matthew chapter 18, I, I'm going to just run through some of these. They're tremendous servant passages in this Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 1 through 5. And I've remembered this so much this week. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child. And placed the child among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. You move just a little bit further in Matthew's Gospel to chapter 19. And here's a rich young guy, he's coming, he looks at Jesus, and he says, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, and boom, 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 boom. Oh, I've done all that from my childhood up. And Jesus said, but you're lacking something. Go sell what you have and give to the poor. And come follow me. And Scripture says he went away, he held his hung his head and went away sorrowful. Jesus knew exactly where the problem was. 
He knew the problem was not keeping man-made and even God-made and ordained regulations in the law, but the problem was the motive and attitude of this young man's heart. And that came through when he held on to his junk and walked away from Jesus. Simon Peter, fisherman, not well educated, crude in speech, sitting over there watching and he looks up to Jesus and he says, Lord, we, we've done all of this. We've done exactly what you said for him to do. What's in it for us? What do we get? And then Jesus gave the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Peter began to understand that we serve not for what we can get out of it, but for the glory of Him who owns us. You see that question that I asked a moment ago, how much time do you have left? None of us really know the answer to that. A whole lot of us are on grace now. And not because of our age, but because of our lifestyle, because of things in the past. That God has forgiven. God has brought us to a place to honor Him and to serve Him and to spread His gospel throughout a city, throughout a community. And we're never too old for that. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 28, James and John's mother comes to Jesus and wants them, one to sit on the right hand and one to sit on the left hand. And Jesus said, and the other ten heard about it and they were unhappy, they were indignant, the word says, that indignant is a strong word. They were upset with James and John. And Jesus called them all together. He said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's servanthood. Are you willing to give your life to Jesus and let him use you however he chooses? It is said in Mark chapter 12, 37, that when Jesus spoke, the common people heard him gladly. All of the problems that we have in organized religion and denominations and all of that kind of stuff is because we've gotten away from servanthood. We've forgotten we're servants. And we've created positions and we've created financial organizations that have enough money to burn a wet elephant, as Festus says, on gun smoke. And you've heard that power corrupts. There's another line to that. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So it's never about us. It's never about who's in control. Yes, there's leadership. Yes, there are giftings of the Holy Spirit. But everything in our life, if we want to be consistent with our profession consistent with our interpretation. Our application must be that of the attitude of a servant of the Lord Jesus and of one another. That's Christianity. That's New Testament Christianity. And if they did things to Jesus... They'll do things to us. Now on that note, I'm going to ask you to follow Jesus. 
I'm going to ask you to say yes to him. Some of you to make public a confession of faith in Christ. If you're here and you've never been born again, doesn't matter if you're a church member or not. There's a lot of church members that start out, that's the first step they know, they take a step toward God, they find out later on, I've joined the church, I've been baptized, I've never been born again. Don't miss heaven because of human pride. Come to Jesus. There are those of you in this room that God wants you to be a part of the fellowship of Calvary Baptist Church. Are we a perfect church? No. Nobody ever claimed that. But I'll tell you what, counting the interim days, I've been here over a year. And every time I found a need, every time I found something that we needed to do in somebody's life, and I picked up the phone and I called one of you and said, I need help. I, I have yet to be turned down. I have yet for any one of you to say no. And so I believe we're in that journey. We just have to pursue and make sure that we have a servant attitude, that our motive is to glorify God, and we're living out what we believe every single day. The truth of God's Word. So I'm going to ask you to come and say, I want to be a part of that journey. I want to put my life in fellowship in this church. And if there are other spiritual needs in your life that you say, I'm just having a hard time connecting with God here, let us help you. We have people who can help you, who will love you, who will pray with you. So would you bow your head with me, please? While our heads are bowed, you make the decision right now in your heart. Pastor, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to do what he asked me to do. And I'm going to do it today. Will you receive it? As our praise team comes, let me pray. And then we'll stand and you stand coming. Father, in Jesus' name, we seek to honor you in all that we say and do. And I pray the response of the people in this room today would be what your Holy Spirit has placed in their hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. As Lance comes.